Hello, and thank you for joining us today for an interview with Dr. Jennifer Horney. Dr. Horney is a professor and founding director of the program in epidemiology and core faculty at the Disaster Research Center at the University of Delaware. She has worked with public agencies globally around disasters, emerging infectious disease outbreaks, and pandemic influenza planning and response. Most recently, her perspective on COVID-19 has been shared on national platforms, including CNN, Business Insider, and Live Science. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we've got lots of questions today, hoping to identify the connection between epidemiology and planning. To kick off the conversation, uh, we're curious to know, what is epidemiology and how does your work connect with disaster preparedness, response, and recovery? So epidemiology is really the study of the distribution of diseases in populations. And so uh, public health as a science was really closely linked historically with urban planning because we had what we call the public health transition when we started to develop cities that were cleaner and try to prevent infectious diseases by having more infrastructure and services in place. Um, So really, in terms of disasters, we think about what the health impacts might be. And then we also think about how things like plans could mitigate health impacts. So if we had a better quality hazard mitigation plan or a better quality recovery plan, could we protect people from the types of injuries and diseases that we see that are both the direct and indirect result of having an exposure to a disaster? Working at the University of Delaware's Disaster Research Center means that you basically live and breathe the topic that's been dominating the news and everyone's mind for the past several weeks. What's it like to observe COVID-19's impact on communities? So this has been really interesting to me because I'm actually teaching a class in outbreak investigation this semester. So before classes even started, I was emailing my students the epidemic curves from China Um, asking them to look at the distribution of cases and who had different exposures. So while I've been trying to make the course not completely about COVID, it's sort of hard to think of uh, covering other types of outbreaks, which are always occurring around the world. Um, So for example, just in the last week, we thought that the Ebola outbreak that's been going on in the DRC for several years was under control, and recently additional cases have been reported. So my students asked if we could talk about what role COVID-19 might play in that. And I think we've also seen recently tornadoes impacting the southeastern United States. And so if we think about things like cascading disasters and complex disasters, uh, what does it look like to be recovering from a tornado during a time of COVID-19? So we don't have that sort of social connection that we frequently look to during recovery from a natural disaster. Um, because we've been asked to be socially distant from our friends and neighbors. And so I think that's been one of the most difficult things for people is that we don't have any other epidemiologic tools to address this pandemic besides these non-pharmaceutical interventions. So we don't have a treatment, we don't have a vaccine. um, And so we have to rely on individuals and communities Uh, to really take seriously. First, we started with the individual level, the hand washing, not touching your face, and then moving on to the community level, non-pharmaceutical interventions like closing schools, closing non-essential businesses, um, canceling gatherings of large groups. So I think that's one of the most interesting questions is how communities are operating when we've basically told them that they can't be part of a community in order to be able to fight the spread of COVID. Can you tell us more about your collaboration with planning agencies in California? How did this collaboration come about? Well, I'm probably the only epidemiologist who had an urban planner on their dissertation committee. Um, So I studied how people make decisions related to evacuation from hurricanes. And so I've worked with planners for a long time um, and, and learned a lot about how planning can impact post-disaster health conditions. Um, And so I had reached been reached out to by some uh, planning groups that were concerned because uh, in most states, construction is still considered an essential uh, business. And so construction is still ongoing, Um, even on campuses that are completely closed, you still have construction. And so 
the fact that construction is ongoing means that people who are in jobs like building inspectors or in planning departments are still needing to work uh, both on site and in the office to ensure that those uh, projects are progressing safely and within code. And so they asked me just to kind of talk about the basic epidemiology of COVID and to answer some questions from people who were concerned that um, their requirement to continue working may expose them um, to uh, COVID-19. What are some of the biggest needs that you've observed during this project? And how could those translate to needs for planners across the U.S.? So I think that the most essential need has been finding science-based information. Um, and so we get a lot of different um, types of advice from different agencies, and not all of it is based in science, and it's hard to know what the right thing to do is. Um, so, for example, I think previously the science had t- has told us that um, surgical masks and hand-sewn masks are not actually very effective and should primarily be used by people who are sick um, or symptomatic to prevent them from spreading um, that to other people who they're around. And so now we've moved into a time when people are saying, you know what, everyone should wear a mask when we're out. We're not really sure about the data and the evidence for how protective it is, but we know that there's uh, both a social benefit in terms of um, people feeling that they're being respected and, and protected, And then there's also sort of a psychological benefit in that people, it's been something that people have come together around. Um, I think it's important that perhaps in some occupations, people may already understand types of personal protective equipment or types of protective actions they might be taking. So for example, um, not knowing much about the day-to-day world of, of planners and inspectors, but if you know you're going to be on site and there are chemicals or dusts or other things that you might be exposed to, then you may already be used to things like um, you know, wearing a mask or wearing gloves or leaving your clothes outside instead of bringing them inside to your family. So I think if we rely on the things that we know that we do for the exposures that we already know about, it's easier to think about building on those known habits and those known operating procedures than to think, oh, well, we're starting completely from scratch because this is a novel pandemic. Yeah, prior to this interview, you shared a really helpful document outlining recommendations for people in the hotel industry on how they might be able to improve guest and staff safety. Um, Are there any key points that planners should keep in mind so that they can reduce their risk of exposure? I think that we should probably be exploring how many things could be done virtually. So are there ways that inspections can maybe be done over FaceTime or using um, some type of uh, video conferencing system like we're all getting very accustomed to doing? Um, Certainly, I'm sure that offices are being restructured in such a way to prevent Um, close contact among workers or among people who may be coming in um, requesting permits or services or other um, types of things like that. Uh, So again, I think that those individual level uh, social distancing type uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions that we've asked people to do, you know, frequently cleaning the surfaces, washing our hands, not touching our face, and really also the thing that we ask people to do Um, a lot, and sometimes we're not that good at doing it, um, is staying home when we're sick. Um, So really taking seriously um, the idea that we need to isolate when we're sick and we need to quarantine if we think we may have been exposed to or had contact with someone who is infected. One thing that comes to mind is that disaster response and long-term planning oftentimes operate on different scales. As we start to think about transitioning back to normal, Um, What are some things that planners should keep in mind as they engage in more long-term planning activities to protect themselves and also to protect their communities? So I think after a disaster is a great time for planners to really shine. Um, We know that we're going to need to revamp all of the planning that we've been doing um, that maybe was focused more on a different type of threat. We're going to have to re weight those hazard assessments and rethink our risk assessments 
um, to factor in this idea of a pandemic maybe a little more prominently than it was before. Um, and I think one thing that is definitely going to be true in this recovery is that it's going to be very long. Um, so we're going to see as we are able to meet the requirements that are being put in place by WHO and by the governors of the different states, as we're able to meet those requirements to begin to open, I think we're going to see a very slow relaxation of the current emergency guidelines that we have. And we're going to see those um, happen maybe on a regional basis. So one thing I think is really interesting is that uh, there are now three regional compacts of governors, uh, public health officials, and economic development officials who are working on reopening as a region. Because we can't imagine that you know, Chicago will be able to reopen at a completely different time than Milwaukee. There's just too much connection between them. Um, being here in Delaware, we're a small state in between P Pennsylvania and New Jersey. So it would make sense that we have to work on a regional level. And I think so I think we'll see a slow relaxation of those social distancing measures. And it's going to take a long time. We're going to have to come in and out of that because we're going to see cases as we begin to relax those measures. And we have to ensure that we have the capacity for the testing and the treatment and the isolation and quarantine of those cases to protect the larger population. Is there anything that you've learned from natural disasters like floods that might have parallels with this pandemic? And what are some of the lessons that planners might be able to draw from this? I think one of the most difficult parts about the pandemic has been that we've had widespread impacts across the U.S. So typically, even in a major disaster like Hurricane Sandy or Hurricane Katrina, only one region of the country is affected. And so other people are able to provide mutual aid, whether that is through um, having evacuation shelters or whether that is sending in resources, uh, personnel, medical material. So this has been really challenging because everyone has been hit uh, pretty much at the same time. Although, of course, you know, we saw the earliest cases in Washington and we saw large uh, clusters in New York and in other settings. It's been difficult for people to imagine how they might provide mutual aid to others. I think the other really big thing from disasters and planning that I've taken from this is what we call in disaster research the false expectation paradox. And so that is when we have a close call with a natural disaster. So maybe a hurricane is forecast to make landfall near us, but at the last minute it veers away. And so the impacts are not that substantial. We tend to underestimate the risk from future events. And so for the last 15 years or so, we've had a couple of pandemics, um, including avian influenza and then the novel influenza H1N1 in 2009. And we've also had some emerging diseases like Zika and Ebola, and none of them have turned out to be super serious to a widespread proportion of the population of the United States. So with H1N1, you know, there was a lot of concern about that, but then we had Tamiflu in place and we knew that that could work to reduce the, um, the length of the symptoms and the severity. And then after a few months, we realized that the infection was not so severe. And so by the time the fall came and a vaccination was available, uh, we had a lot of data and understanding of that. Um, so with this being a brand new novel coronavirus, I think we have that, um, that problem that we really weren't expecting this because the last few times we've dealt with a pandemic or a novel disease, it's uh, sort of had given us that false expectation that we'd be able to deal with it pretty effectively. Um, so maybe it's time in terms of planning to think, uh, again, to think a little bit more outside the box, to really revisit our, um, our hazard assessments and to really rethink what our levels of risk are, particularly from something that would be um, impacting all areas of the country at once. I think that's a really great segue into the next question, which um, we're curious to know, what are some opportunities for planners to serve as allies to health professionals like yourself? 
So I think it's really important to leverage the expertise of planners in terms of a lot of things. We do develop things like continuity of operations plans or pandemic influenza plans um, as part of public health preparedness. But we don't have a lot of touch points in with the other network of plans that govern um, things like business development or things like um, hazard mitigation. So I think that's a, a, a limitation in how we operate in that we should have been thinking as we had a pandemic plan, how does this link in with business development? Um, are there things that might be able to be shifted, for example, um, that would need to be open because of the health sector response that could be taken from an area of the business uh, community that might be impacted in, in a very severe way? So I'm not sure what any of those things are at this point, but I think broadening this idea of how a network of plans can work together across um, a community to make them more prepared and more resilient, that from the planning side, maybe planners need to think um, to include more people from public health and hospitals in their discussions and in their plan making that ensure that they are uh, not only a participant, but an active participant. And on the flip side, those from the healthcare sector who are making these plans to continue operations during a pandemic need to be thinking about the expertise that we have from the planning sector and how that might improve the quality of, of the plans that we make in the healthcare sector. Are there any resources that you would like to share with uh, planners who might be interested in learning more about this topic? The CDC has developed uh, guidelines uh, for many different professions and many different population groups, and they're constantly adding to those. And so they do have guidelines for a number of settings. And so I think it's always useful to check and determine if so those guidelines, even if they aren't exactly for planners, uh, maybe they're for a different type of profession or a different type of group uh, that, that planners might be represented by. Where can we learn more about your work? So the Disaster Research Center at the University of Delaware is one of the oldest disaster research centers in the country. Um, and it's a place where you can find a lot of information about cutting edge research and response to disasters. They're actually coordinating a large qualitative study as to better understand the societal impacts of COVID, which I think will be a really unique contribution to this literature. Jennifer, thanks again for joining us. And uh, it's been a pleasure speaking with you and learning more about your work and also how epidemiology can connect with planning. Thank you.